Hello everyone, welcome back to our online service and uh, in case you're new, I'd like to let you, get, you know that uh, we do this every single week on uh, Sunday mornings and I invite you to join us and uh, everybody who's a regular to uh, worship along with us this morning. Thank you and let's get into it. surface of my anxious imagination beckons a calmness that is found in you alone it washes over every doubt every imperfection Jesus, your presence is the comfort of my soul. There's nowhere I'd rather be when you're singing over me. I just want to be. I'm lost in your mystery I'm found in your love for me I just want to be here with you Here in the waiting I won't worry about tomorrow to focus on the things I can't control All my attention
when you're singing over me I just wanna be here with you I'm lost in the mystery I'm found in your love for me I just So, of course, at Delta Church, we uh, read through the scriptures every Sunday, publicly and out loud. Normally, we would do it where the congregation does one verse and the reader does one verse, but because we're doing this on the internet, we're not going to be able to do that. So, today, we are finishing off the Gospel of Mark, and we're reading together Mark chapter 16, verses 9 to 20. So, this is how it goes. After Jesus rose from the dead early on Sunday morning, the first person who saw him was Mary Magdalene, the woman from whom he had cast out seven demons. She went to the disciples who were grieving and weeping and told them what had happened. But when she told them that Jesus was alive and she had seen him, they didn't believe her. Afterwards, he appeared in different form to two of his followers who were walking from Jerusalem into the country. They rushed back to tell the others, but no one believed them. Still later, he appeared to the eleven disciples as they were eating together, and he rebuked them for their stubborn unbelief because they refused to believe those who had seen him after he'd been raised from the dead. And then he told them, Go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. Anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved, but anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. These miraculous signs will accompany those who believe. They will cast out demons in my name and in, will speak in new languages. And uh, they will be able to handle snakes and, with safety, and if they drink anything poisonous, it won't hurt them. They will be able to place their hands on the sick, and they will be healed. When the Lord Jesus had finished talking with them, he was taken up into heaven and sat down in the place of honor at God's right hand. And the disciples went everywhere and preached and the Lord worked through them confirming what they said with many miraculous signs may God bless the public reading of the Bible God bless you God's Word is so good it's wonderful to be able to read some scripture with you all today now I'd like to invite you to pray with me uh, if it's this morning or this evening this afternoon whenever wherever you are watching this why don't you join with us and pray church God I thank you for bringing us together today I thank you that you are good that you love us Lord and I thank you that you are seeking and yearning and longing for a relationship with, with each one of your sons and daughters. Lord, I thank you that you're a God who wants to be found and who will be found by those who seek you. God, this morning I'd like to pray for those of us who are watching who need a touch of just your grace in their lives, Lord. I ask that you would start to minister to hearts. Lord, I pray right now that you would actually start softening the hearts of the listeners here. God, we have some uh, more worshiping to do. We're going to be singing. We're going to be listening to a sermon, God. And I ask that you would prepare our hearts to be uh, not just um, hearing these words and letting them pass through, but really sinking deep into our hearts and minds and allowing change and obedience to happen. God, I, I ask that uh, we would truly be changed by this encounter we're going to have with you, uh, your presence, and our fellow believers. Lord, I ask, also ask for uh, some needs to be met today. I know that there are many needs in our community, uh, small needs, large needs, whatever it is. God, we know we can't live our lives without you, and so today we ask that you would be provider for us. Those of us who are looking to have financial needs met, God, would you in your power meet those needs? We know that you're bigger than money. We know that 
the issues we face are no match for your power and your abilities and so just like you clothe the lilies in the field i ask that you would meet our needs would you provide for us as well lord i also pray for those of us who might be struggling with some relationship problems lord it's, it's been on my heart recently to be peace makers peace creators and not just peacekeepers and so i pray that uh you would help us do that well. I pray, God, that you would start massaging some of the knots in our friendship and relationships, Lord. I know that the way we love each other, the way that Christians love other Christians, that's supposed to be a representation of your love for everyone. And so I pray that we would be able to walk in forgiveness, God. I pray that we would uh, seek healing in these hurt relationships so that people around us would know who we serve. Would they know that we serve you because of the way we conduct ourselves with each other? Lord, I ask that uh, as we have our needs met by you, as we uh, seek you for relationships, God, we would also have uh, your healing touch in our bodies as well. Lord, I ask for your ministering in those of us with chronic health conditions. I ask, Lord, that you would would protect our bodies and restore our bodies for those who are feeling a little extra tired and bogged down and exhausted in their heart and their bones. Lord, would you give them strength and would you give them the ability to persevere? Lord, I know that there are lots of concerns, and so that's why we take this time to place our worries and our anxieties and our cares on you, Father. You're the only one who can take those. And so today with my brothers and sisters, we just want to give you everything. We want to give you our joys, yes, our celebrations, but we also want to give you the really hard things and say, Father, would you take these for us? Our the yoke we're carrying is, is too heavy for our, so please, Father, you take it and we will take relationship with you instead. We'll take your goodness and your grace and your Father heart instead. So, I thank you for what you're going to do, for what you have done already, and everything you have planned for Delta Church. We know you're faithful, God, and we love you so much. So, in Jesus' name, I pray all of these things. Amen.
Hello maker of the moon Your creation has inspired my every move You're the science in the stars There is beauty, there is fire in your eyes Here we are face to face Lost in wonder at the God I can feel your heartbeat beating I can hear my God is speaking King of creation Breathe upon me You can feel my heartbeat beating You can hear my spirit screaming King of creation You amaze me I can feel
Hello, maker of the moon. You were there when I was in my mother's womb. Hi everyone, I'm here to give you just a few announcements, so listen up. Firstly, as we do most weeks, we have our Soul Care and Prayer Group meeting Monday night at 7 p.m. Whether you've been with us for a little time or a long time, this is a great opportunity for you to connect with your brothers and sisters in Christ as we grow together, as we pray for each other, we get to know each other a little bit better, and we really uh, experience God's faithfulness. I know it's a really encouraging time where Pastor Jeff and others get to uh, continue to live life closely with our hearts close together even though we are practicing social distancing or meeting online but this is a really really good opportunity for you to continue some really important relationships so please be there soul care and prayer Monday night at 7 p.m. Secondly, if you were with us last week, you'll remember that I announced our change, our revamp of our prayer chain. So in the past, we've had a prayer chain. There are some individuals who have served faithfully in our prayer chain for many years. But what we'd like to do is we'd like to expand that a little bit into our prayer network. So instead of just a linear way of praying, uh, passing from one individual to the next, we'd like a network of people who are ready and willing to serve the the needs of our community at a moment's notice. So we're looking for you prayer warriors. If you want to be available for crisis prayer moments, for immediate needs that come up, if you would like to be interceding on behalf of those who really need a touch of the Lord and His grace, then this is for you. So please get a hold of the church either from the admin email, which is admin at mydeltachurch.ca, or you can contact Pastor Jeff or me as well. We would love to hear from you, and we're eager to get our new prayer, work, prayer network up and running. So that's all the announcements I have for you. Have a great rest of your service. Thanks for connecting with Delta Church Online. I hope that you've already experienced the presence of God with you wherever you're at. And if there's one thing I pray you'd have today, it's this, that God knows you. He knows your name, your situation, your thoughts and anxieties and joys and love. God doesn't miss a thing and he loves you still. So let's pray together. Lord Jesus, as we delve into... Uh, First Thessalonians for the last time in this group of sermons. I'm asking that people he, who are listening would have ears to hear and hearts to receive what you would say through this sermon and that uh, we would be able to move forward in you with anointing, with grace, to be a blessing wherever we go. We love you and we thank you for your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. In the preaching of Delta Church for the last few months, we've been methodically going through the first letter Paul wrote to his friends in the ancient city of Thessalonica in what is modern Greece. The story of what happened while he and Silas were there is told in some detail from Acts chapter 17, 1 to 10. Paul and Silas, then traveling through the towns of Amphipolis and Apollonia, and came to Thessalonica where there's a Jewish synagogue. As was Paul's custom, he went to the synagogue service and for three Sabbaths in a row, he used the scriptures to reason with the people. He explained the prophecies and proved that the Messiah must suffer and rise from the dead. He said, this Jesus I'm telling you about is the Messiah. Some of the Jews who listened were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, along with many God-fearing Greek men and quite a few prominent women. But... Some of the Jews were jealous, so they gathered some troublemakers from the marketplace to form a mob and started a riot. Kind of sounds familiar, doesn't it? They attacked the home of Jason, searching for Paul and Silas so they could drag them out to the crowd. Not finding them there, they dragged out Jason and some of the other believers instead and took them before the city council. Paul and Silas have caused trouble all over the world, they shouted. And now they're here disturbing our city too. And Jason has welcomed them into his home. They're all guilty of treason against Caesar, for they profess allegiance to another king named Jesus. 
The people of the city, as well as the city council, were thrown into turmoil by these reports. So the officials forced Jason and the other believers to post bond, and then they released them. That, that very night, the believers sent Paul and Silas to Berea. So eventually, after all of this, Paul and Silas ended up in Athens for a while after leaving. And he was anxious about how his friends back in Thessalonica were doing. So we just read about how when Paul left town, they were experiencing opposition and persecution. And now Paul was in another city and he couldn't do anything to encourage his friends or even protect them because he wasn't physically there and he must have felt really helpless about it all. So soon after he came to Athens, he sent a trusted ministry partner, Timothy, to Thessalonica to find out how it was going for their friends. While Timothy was away, Paul left Athens and moved into Corinth, where he was able to take up residence and pastor the church there in Corinth for another two years. And when Timothy returned from Thessalonica to Corinth, his report about how things were going was very, very good. And so Apostle Paul, I think, was relieved and he was happy. And you can actually pick up his mood in the way that he wrote the letter that's now part of the New Testament. But there were also some issues and there was some confusion in the church that Timothy told him about. So their Thessalonian friends had questions. And uh, Paul wrote 1 Thessalonians to address what Timothy told him. Now, as I said a moment ago, We've done a, a, a section by section study of 1 Thessalonians for the last while. And if you want, you can access all of the other sermons in this group through Delta Church's website. It's www.mydeltachurch.ca. And you'll be directed to Delta Church's YouTube channel. And by the way, there are also a lot of music our worship teams made throughout the pandemic for you to enjoy and worship along with. And I think if you do that, your spirit's going to be lifted and encouraged. So along with other sermons in this group, with this one, we come to the end of 1 Thessalonians. And it's been a rich, helpful study dealing with fears and anxieties that are common to humans, such like difficulties in death, in life, and the second coming of Christ. And in this section, this sermon's focused on, you're going to find it's chock full of advice and commandments for how a follower of Jesus ought to live in the middle of very difficult and challenging circumstances. You know, as followers of Jesus in the 21st century, while, while we in the West don't face persecution or the threat of, to our lives because of our faith in the same way the Thessalonians did, when Paul wrote them, we do face opposition, both individually and collectively. Now, some of this opposition is because of the moral beliefs those who follow Jesus have regarding salvation. You know, we believe everyone's a sinner and everyone needs God's forgiveness through Jesus in order to have the gift of salvation and that Jesus is the only way to God. Most people don't want to admit they're sinners and they certainly don't believe Jesus is the only way to being right with God nowadays. As followers of Jesus, we also hold strong beliefs about life. We're pro-life and the Bible's view of marriage and sexual ethics. And these are all reasons that will often foment opposition towards the church and individual Christians. Fair enough. But there are other reasons for some of the opposition that comes our way that, frankly, isn't biblical. Many of our Christian friends in the United States seem to think that it's Christian to promote the use of guns. And some of them strongly hold certain flavors and political views about health care and other things. You know, as an observer and a Canadian Christian leader, I'm often confounded by, by what I perceive to be a melting together of a form of patriotism with cherry-picked scriptures that it's now morphed into a secular religion of nationalism. Jesus said, His kingdom is not of this world, of this reality. And the allegiance of a follower of Jesus is, first of all, to Jesus. My point is there's opposition that comes our way, that is, for biblical and non-biblical reasons. But because of this opposition, at times it feels uncomfortable to be known as a follower of Jesus. And I think it's okay to admit that. But the goal of myself and many people I know is to live for Jesus and with the power of the Holy Spirit within, look for ways to live that will glorify God. Every day, wherever we're at, at work, at home, 
at play. And in this section of 1 Thessalonians, Paul gives some of the ways. So let's read it. Dear brothers and sisters, honor those who are your leaders in the Lord's work. They work hard among you and give you spiritual guidance. Show them great respect and wholehearted love because of their work. And live peaceably or peacefully with each other. Brothers and sisters, we urge you to warn those who are lazy. Encourage those who are timid. Take tender care of those who are weak. Be patient with everyone. Seek that no one, see that no one pays back evil for evil, but always try to do good to each other and to all people. Always be joyful. Never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Do not stifle the Holy Spirit. Do not scoff at prophecies, but test everything that is said. Hold on to what is good. Stay away from every kind of evil. Now may the God of peace make you holy in every way, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. God will make this happen, for he who calls you is faithful. Dear brothers and sisters, pray for us. Greet the, all the brothers and sisters with a sacred kiss. I command you in the name of the Lord to read this letter to all the brothers and sisters. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. You know, at Thanksgiving 2020, I used the middle of this section, 1 Thessalonians 5.18, in the sermon on being thankful. It says, be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. And I said that if you are following Jesus, it's actually God's will for you in your everyday living to be thankful. And isn't it true that lots of people want to know what God's will is for their lives? Maybe you do. You want to know, you want God to let you know about things like what school you should attend or what course of study you should take or where you should live or who you should marry or what job you should take, you know, personal stuff like that. Well, at Thanksgiving, I asked if you ever thought the will of God for your life is to be thankful in all circumstances. Yet this is God's will for you and for every one of us. And we do that because the biblical truth is we receive everything we have because of, the, of grace and mercy and generosity on God's part. And not because we deserve anything. Everything we have is a gift from him. But thankfulness isn't the only thing Paul told the Thessalonians is God's will for our lives or for your life. There are other things that have to do with attitudes God wants people who follow Jesus to display that are his will for you as well. Here's the list from 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 to 22. Give appropriate respect to church leaders. So let's remember the leaders in the th that the leaders in the Thessalonian congregation were not very long in the faith just like the others who were in the church. In terms of chronology, it was not an old church. It was a young church. But the great thing is God anoints and equips people in his church to do what he wants them to do, including lead. Another one is that God's will, it's God's will for you to live at peace with each other. And folks, this includes social networks. The social network part, of course, isn't in the original Greek manuscript of Paul's letter. But social networks are where the rubber hits the road for this kind of stuff nowadays. And it's God's will for you that you aren't disruptive or disorderly. God wants you to be about encouraging and caring for your family, your relatives, your friends, and, your, and strangers. Another on the list is one that I'd like to read word for word. <laughs> be patient with everyone. I'm going to do it again. Be patient with everyone. That means at home, at work, and on social media. On the ground, this means not worrying about getting back at the person or persons who harmed you, but being good to everyone. Jesus actually said, love your enemies. So what else is there about, uh, about God's will for you in this section? Be joyful, be thankful, welcome the spiritual gifts God the Holy Spirit gives the church, and don't despise them, especially true prophecy. Now all of these things are, are, are ways that you accomplish God's will for your life and live in the middle of the circumstances that I described earlier with the opposition that we sometimes experience nowadays as followers of Jesus. But now I'd like to focus 
on the part that says live at peace with everyone. Have you ever read Jesus' Sermon on the Mount from Matthew 5 and 6? If you read it, you'll, you'll with the idea that you're going to be able to accomplish it, <laughs> you're going to quickly come to the point of realizing that it is impossible to live that way. But being impossible is the point. Because if trying to live a good life were possible, more people would do it. And they'd be able to say that it was because of their own efforts that they did it. But the consistent biblical perspective is that we've all sinned, and we all come short of God's glory, and so we all need Jesus. And Jesus' forgiveness and God the Holy Spirit's enabling that gives us the supernatural ability to actually do the stuff that Paul's identifying in 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 to 22. For instance, let's take 1 Thessalonians 5, 15. See that no one pays back evil for evil, but always try to do good to each other and to all people. Now, what do you do with that? Because this goes against the perspective that many of us have in our culture. G.K. Beale wrote this about it, and I think it's true. We live in a litigious society in which people zealously protect their individual rights by filing lawsuits over ludicrous issues. And while it's legitimate to impose reciprocal pay repayment or penalty when someone's civil or economic rights are violated, chaos results when this is rigidly applied to interpersonal relationships. So let me challenge you by asking, is it the godly thing to do that when you're offended to keep a grudge until you're able to pay back the one who hurt you or did you wrong? How would life go if that were the case? And it's God's will for you not to repay or not to pay back evil for evil, but to always try to do good to everyone. Jesus himself said this, do to others what you would have them do to you. So what do you do when you're the victim of something really, really, really terrible? Well, frankly, that's a tough question, but the principle here is to always try to do good to everyone. And in the power and equipping of the Holy Spirit, God living in you, if you're following Jesus and his way, then this is the starting point. It's the motivation. It's the way God's going to be leading you. And as a Holy Spirit-led Christian, the first thing he'll put into your mind is the desire not to take revenge. Now, not taking revenge doesn't mean that if there needs to be something brought up in a court of law, it shouldn't be because we want to do, uh, because we want to do good to the perpetrator or not take vengeance. See, laws and police and the court system are all there for your protection and to mete out justice. And remember, God is a God of justice. So for crimes and mis misdemeanors, justice ought to be, and in fact must be, served. But in your individual walk down the road of your life, Paul's telling you to try to be good to everyone. And just in case you think he was picking and choosing the audience to tell this to, let's remember the Christians in Thessalonica were being persecuted and harmed. Paul and Silas had fled for their personal protection and to try to quell the unrest they'd caused the church while they were there. And it's to this group of people that Paul wrote, see that no one pays back evil for evil, but always try to do good to each other and to all people. And not only that, this is what he said to other churches as well. Look at Romans 12, 18. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with each everyone. Now I'm going to tell you right now, this kind of thing is impossible to do. But with God, the impossible becomes possible. It's why God made some of these things so hard. So that the only way you'll be able to do what he's asking, even requiring, is through the power and, and, and strength of the Holy Spirit. In another letter, Paul wrote to a group of Christians who were experiencing challenges because of their faith as well. For I can do all everything through Christ who gives me strength. That's Philippians 4.13. So it's Jesus who is God who gives you the strength to do the things God wants you to do. 
And the reality is that none of these things from 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 to 22 come naturally or quickly or are things that you, you get in a one-time experience. If ability and strength to live this way comes from the depth of your relationship with Jesus and how much control of your life, your emotions, thoughts and actions you've given over to the Holy Spirit. All of the good qualities from 1 Thessalonians 5 come from the hidden resources that you develop as you let Jesus change you, as, as you pray, as you listen for his promptings, as you study the Bible, as you do good, and as you worship him. These are things that aren't public, but are quiet behind the scenes things that strengthen you. And you know, when you think about it, most things on this planet depend on, on hidden resources. Every animal requires air to breathe. You can't see air. The great trees send down their roots into the earth to draw up water and minerals, and you can't see that happening. And a river has its source in the snow-capped mountains and the rains that add to it as it meanders through towards the oceans. And in some ways, the most important part of the tree or the river is the part that you can't see. And in some ways, the most important part of the river is, is the, the up in the hills or the mountains where the snow is melting. And by analogy, the most important part of a Christian's life is the part that only God sees, the commitment, the commitment that we have to him and the thoughts and intentions of our hearts and our minds. And so when it comes right down to it, unless you draw on the deep resources of God by faith, you're going to fail to live up to the high ideals that Paul wrote about in 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 to 22, because these qualities don't come naturally and they don't necessarily come quickly. They're not something you get in a one-time experience. They come from the depth of your relationship with Jesus and how much you've conformed to the Holy Spirit's will in your day-to-day -day living. God, the Holy Spirit is omnipotent, omniscient, eternal. God, and he lives in your heart, making you more and more like Jesus. Scholar N.T. Wright uses the analogy of learning a second language to describe this process and growth. When he was young, a good teacher helped him and his classmates learn French grammar, and they did it through learning little ditties, little songs. During the exams, he'd hum them to himself in order to help remember the answers to the questions, and they all did very, very well. And he writes... When learning a second language, there are the equivalents of the little rules of grammar, the rhymes and memory aids which nudge the mind in the right direction. 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 to 22 may well be a list of these, designed for easy memorization, which Paul has put together so that his young churches will learn, quickly learn the behavior or the language of Christian behavior. <laughs> I like that, the language of Christian behavior. It's not your mother tongue. And as you conform to the Holy Spirit in all of the circumstances of your life, this language will become more and more normal. You know, the computer I wrote this sermon on is an excellent device that helps with my study and sermon notes and other things. And I appreciate it a lot. But it's just a useless pile of parts wrapped in an attractive package without power. It needs to have the power of electricity to be the excellent device it's designed to be. And the same is when it comes to doing God's will for your life from for the first Thessalonians 5 list. You need God's power. So as a reminder, the list from 1 Thessalonians 5 that make up God's will for you are respect church leaders, live at peace with each other, don't be disruptive or disorderly, encourage others, be patient with everyone, be joyful, be thankful, and welcome the spiritual gifts that God the Holy Spirit gives the church and don't despise them, especially true prophecy. Let's admit that to be here all the time will require leaning on the everlasting arms of God. So let me ask you, are you leaning? Why don't you open yourself up to God and be open to the Holy Spirit's nudge of your heart right now as we pray? 1 Thessalonians 5, 23-24 says, Now may the God of peace make you holy in every way and make your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless until the Lord Jesus Christ comes again. 
God will make this happen, for he who calls you is faithful. So be set apart and blameless, for this is God's will for your life. And it's God who will make it happen as you determine to follow after him in all your circumstances. So let's pray. You know, Father, we're grateful for the way that you led Paul to write this letter to the uh, Christians in Thessalonica. And it's been rich and it's been good to be able to connect with it. But today, we have been confronted with Christian morality in a difficult and challenging time. The, these Thessalonians, Lord, they, they lived with the threat on their lives and their, their well-being. And so uh, Paul, when Paul wrote them to be good to everybody, it, that speaks to us as well. We need you. We need you in the midst of challenging, a challenging political scene. We need you in the midst of the pandemic. We need you in the midst of family strife. We need you in the midst of it all. Oh God, where would we be without you? So would you stir up in our hearts the power and passion of the Holy Spirit to live according to the way that you want us to. And if it is at all possible, as far as it concerns us, we'll live at peace with everybody. Help us to do this everywhere we are in every, in every compartment of our lives that, that exists. We want to be like you and we want to bless people because of what you've done to bless us. So we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I hope you have an excellent day wherever you're at and whatever you're doing. Thanks for being with us online for Delta Church. God bless you.